Welcome everyone to All Land is Indigenous. Uh, this is a webinar hosted by the Hamilton Wenham Human Rights Coalition, and we are very excited to welcome you here today to talk about a number of um, exciting topics. Uh, before we get started, I would like to offer an Atlantic and land acknowledgement. We all live on Indigenous land. We would like to acknowledge the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of Indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth of Massachusetts have taken their name. We would like to pay our respect to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historical Massachusetts tribe territories to this day. I'm joined today by two wonderful speakers, possibly a third. Uh, with us, we have Mary Ellen Lepionka, who is a local scholar and historian and anthropologist who has studied extensively the indigenous communities of Cape Ann. Um, and she will be speaking on a number of topics related to local populations and historical challenges, uh, sort of specific to Cape Ann, but a little bit within Massachusetts as well. We also are joined by Dr. James Nez of Navajo Nation. He is a behavioral health therapist and also a lawyer, if I'm not completely mistaken. So don't let the doctor fool you entirely. Um, he'll be speaking about some of the unique legal challenges and cultural issues that are um, present in Navajo Nation, which is a little bit different than some of the sort of groups that we're familiar with here today. So. Um, after that, we will have some uh, sort of uh, moderated Q&A prompts. There's some questions that we're going to chew over. And then at the end, if anyone in the audience has questions that you would like us to ask um, or address, you know, go ahead and raise your hand. And I'm sure that the panel will have a, be happy to answer those questions as well. So uh, without further ado, Mary Ellen, I'll turn it over to you. Um, and if you'd like to share your screen, you should be able to. OK. How's that? Is that good? Looks great. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, I just want to start by saying that for generations, we've been falsely educated about indigenous people here, uh, so much so that I think changing the canon is going to be the greatest challenge of this generation and possibly the next one as well. Um, in town after town in Essex County, uh, local historians and archivists uh, tend to dismiss uh, indigenous history. Um, if it's mentioned at all, it's a great mystery, except for every town's last Indian, indigenous people were effectively erased from both memory and landscape. This is what I learned in 10 years of research on the subject. My presentation focuses on ways to unerase this history, how we could begin to correct our stories and bring new stories, the ones we weren't told, into the light. Now, understanding the phenomenon uh, referred to uh, by erasure, and this actually was invented um, by indigenous historians, um, this gives us a clue of what we need to do to reverse the process. Erasure happens in the history of every society and in every time period, but I only learned about it in the course of my research on indigenous history here. Um, I was told everywhere that there were no Indians here when the English settled, that they had either died out or disappeared by the time of English settlement. And I knew this couldn't be true. Uh, and please forgive me for using the word Indian. I'm using it in a historical context and otherwise always refer to them as indigenous people, which seems to be the current, current preference. Um, I first got interested in this question when I saw Samuel de Champlain's map of Gloucester Harbor. He uh, made this map in 1606 and it shows 15 wigwams uh, with their corn patches or kitchen gardens. And they're in an open parkland with managed groves of trees. And there's a causeway that they built to Rocky Neck, which, which was an island. Uh, and there is a wigwam on my street. So having been told that there were no Indians here, uh, and actually people didn't even recognize those dome shapes as wigwams, it was a big revelation to everybody that there were Indians here. Uh, Champlain counted about 200 people in the harbor. At that time, he estimated another 1,500 people on Cape Ann alone, and then 2,000 more people up the coast in uh, Ipswich. The English uh, uh, went to uh, Gloucester Harbor only 16 years later. So uh, 14,000 people became extinct in that period? I don't think so. 
I began by conducting a, a study or a survey of artifacts from Essex County in museums and historical societies and in private collections. Uh, and I visited archaeological sites. And I was stunned by the huge quantity and depth of physical evidence for indigenous occupation in Essex County, uh, over 12,000 years worth, uh, including solid evidence for year round coastal settlement, the practice of horticulture, the cultivation of corn, and of sites still being occupied at the, during the time of uh, English settlement. I then surveyed uh, uh, the literature of first-hand observers in the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, but there was a problem because uh, I came across only one source that asked the same question I was, uh, and that was Joseph Felt in his History of Salem in 1845. And he says, quote, why is it said there were no Indians here during the colonial period? Earlier histories must be incorrect in claiming that the Indians were extinct prior to the establishment of Massachusetts Bay Colony because there are so many accounts of them, end of quote. He went on to say that he couldn't find any information about what had happened to them, except that collectors found, quote, Indian town, end of quote, full of bones. And that up until 1725, indigenous people visited Salem every year and camped out on Gallows Hill. There is no mention of any Indian town in histories of Salem today or in any of the tourist sites today. These are the narratives of erasure. Try to minimize uh, the thumbnails. These narratives were created by colonial governors and by early town historians. They have been perpetuated in folk histories ever since and they're in danger of becoming immortalized via the internet. It's, it's scary how much misinformation has reached the, uh, made it onto uh, Wikipedia, for example. Uh, if indigenous people are mentioned at all, uh, they're usually dismissed in uh, simple paragraphs that repeat the erasure narratives, like this one, which is from uh, the history of Manchester by the sea by uh, Lampson in 1895. The history of America begins uh, with the advent of Europeans in the new world. The red men in small and scattered bands roamed the stately forests and interminable prairies, hunted the bison and the deer, fished the lakes and streams, gathered around the council fire and danced the war dance. But they planted no states, founded no cities, established no manufactures, engaged in no commerce, cultivated no arts, built up no civilizations. They left their names upon mountains and rivers, but they made no other impress upon the continent, which from time immemorial had been their dwelling place. The record of their past vanishes like one of their own forays into the wilderness. Their shell heaps and their graves are the only remains left to show that they once called these lands their own. They made no history. And this is the story that we have inherited. Uh, but the erasure narratives are not true. And these are some of the reasons why they're still here. They do have histories. They left monuments. If they appeared to disappear, it was uh, only briefly and they became visible again whenever they were able to. Um, they were not nomads. They did not all die out from disease. They did not uh, kill each other off and so on. So there is evidence to dispute all of the narratives of erasure. But most coastal New England histories and centennial addresses dismiss the subject except in reference to deeds, treaty signings, accusations of mischief, fear of uprising, and laws regulating commerce. And town after town history begins with the quit claim deeds signed by local Sagamores and Sockums with their notarized signatory marks. In 1700, for example, Wenham's, uh, Wenham's soul was sold uh, uh, by Mascanomet's heirs for three pounds, 10 shillings. Colonists were taxed to cover the cost. Other towns did likewise or sold land to come up with the money. 
Local histories tend to claim that the Indians uh, brought two rounds of claims against the towns, essentially double dipping. In reality, the first deeds were granted before there were any of these, of these other towns. Uh, and um, it, the second time it was because the Dominion of Massachusetts required colonists to obtain and pay for legal title to the land, which otherwise would become the property of the King of England. This was uh, after the Massachusetts Bay Charter was vacated after the English Civil War and restoration of the English monarchy, which declared that all the original Indian deeds were no longer valid. And that's why the round of quitclaim deeds was conducted between 1700 and 1703. Now, interestingly, I was checking this out, your official history of Hamilton, which was originally a neighborhood in Ipswich, focuses on Masconomet's sale of Essex County to the English. It's full of factual errors. Uh, Masconomet was a Sagamore or Sogma, which is not the same thing as a chief. Um, historically, these member were members of high ranking families defined by their descent within a dominant or founding lineage. They inherited their status and they served as stewards of their kin group and its homelands. Also, Masconomet did not sell uh, Aguam. Uh, he uh, actually uh, gave land around Aguam in 1636 to John Winthrop Jr. to thank him for his help in repelling their enemies. Uh, Masconomet also invited the English to occupy the village, the Aguam village, and his fort in the Castle Neck River to be on hand for future defense. Uh, the defense was a primary concern because there were northern hunter-gatherers such as the Mi'kmaq or, or Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet or the Wilaster Wiwiak, the Passamaquoddy or Pescamaquoddy, and sometimes the Penobscot or the Penawapskek, and those people were conducting raids on their southern neighbors for corn. Uh, the, this was because of the Little Ice Age, which was a cooling period between 1300 and 1800, when corn would not grow in the northern latitudes. Great, they would make raids down the coast, coming down by canoe to get corn from the agricultural villages all along the coast. Winthrop Jr. paid 20 pounds for Masconomet's gift of land because in one of its first degrees, decrees, the Mass Bay Colony made it illegal to take Indian land without giving compensation for it, quote, so as to avoid the least scrupulo of intrusion, end of quote. And in 1638, Masconomet gave Winthrop Jr. more land for the establishment of the plantation of Ipswich, uh, all the way up to the Merrimack River, and he was again paid 20 pounds. Winthrop Jr. went to court to get reimbursed by Ipswich for the first 20 pounds. To the Pawtucket, this was not a sale, it was reciprocity. It was their tradition of paying tribute to a larger or more powerful band for their protection. The money was at first meaningless to them as currency, as was the commodification of land. They did not for a long time understand about the commodification of natural resources. Indigenous people were not naive, however, as is often claimed. They very quickly realized that these transactions could lead to permanent alienation from their land. And they became very careful in wording their deeds to reserve space and resources for themselves. This only worked for a little while because they were under constant uh, pressure by uh, expanding co colonists. Families gradually left, but the Sagamores doing their duty would often stick it out to the end, and they were often the only indiv individuals mentioned in the early colonial histories. They were the only ones still there. Masconomet had become impoverished. He was a ward of the town. He actually had to go to court to sue Ipswich for enough land to sustain his family. The court granted him six acres. He did not die in 1676, as your history says. He died in 1658, just three years after being granted his six acres. And as you uh, no doubt uh, know, his gravesite and that of his wife and other family members 
uh, in South Hamilton is now under the protection of the Essex County Greenbelt Association. And then in your official history of Wenham, which was originally part of Salem, the indigenous people are dismissed in this single sentence, again, referring to the purchase of land. Prior to European contact, Agawam was not a tribe or even a territory. The word Agawam refers to the Great Marsh, which was what was attracting people to that area. Uh, the Algonquians in the Northeast did not have sovereign territories. They did not draw territorial lines as shown on Sidney Purley's famous map of Indian lands. The map reveals the way Europeans applied concepts from European history to what they presumed to be true of people in the Western Hemisphere. Terms like clan, tribe, nation, and sovereignty are all European constructs from European history which indigenous people actually came to apply to themselves. Indigenous people had traditional areas that were assigned intergenerationally to various fam to different families, but they moved freely throughout New England. Maybe you remember the story that you got in third grade about uh, Samoset or Samoset, his name was probably more Samoset than Samoset. He greeted the Mayflower pilgrims down in Plymouth and spoke English to them in 1620. According to William Bradford, he said, welcome English. Well, Samoset was an Abenaki Sakam from Maine. He was on pilgrimage. He had learned English from fishermen on Monhegan Island because Europeans had been fishing in the Gulf of Maine for a hundred years prior to the Mayflower landing. Agawam was the name of a village, the name of the village of the people who came to the Great Marsh. Now, this is a detail from a historic map. It's a uh, LeBaron's 1874 archaeological survey. Agawam village was on Castle Neck River, indicated here by the Green Triangle. And the Sagamore Masconomet had a fort, uh, which was on Castle Island in the river, right in front of the village, protecting their cornfields. Their cornfields were in the red circled area off Argilla Road. Argilla Road was an Indian trail. Most of the coastal villages and watchtowers had, had watchtowers and forts to guard against those enemy corn raids. Maskinomet had a residence on Hog Island, now called Choate Island, and he conducted diplomacy on Castle Hill. The entire seaward side of Hog Island is land that has been created by a thousand years worth of deposition of the remains of shellfish meals. At the time of English settlement, the people in Northern Essex County and Northern Middlesex County were Pawtucket people. They were an expansion of the Penacook from the lower Merrimack Valley in New Hampshire, who came to the coast and the Great Marsh via the Merrimack River. They were organized as patrilineal bands, paying tribute to one another in shifting alliances and confederations. They spoke an ancient Abenaki language called Loop B, which has no living speakers today. In the 16th and early 17th centuries, the Penacook Pawtucket homelands and sphere of influence extended in an arc from Lake Winnipesaukee to Boston's North Shore. Bands in Southern Essex County and Southern Middlesex County became interrelated with the Nipmuc and Massachusetts people. The people in Northern Essex and Middlesex counties were identified as Pawtucket by the Puritan minister, John Eliot, who translated the Bible into Massachusetts and also by Daniel Gookin, the first Indian agent of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Colonists also referred to them as the Agawam Indians or the Namkiag Indians or the Wemisit Indians after principal villages. What the Pawtucket called themselves, we don't know because there are no people today who identify as Pawtucket. One ethnographer recorded that they simply refer to themselves by the name of their village or by the name of their lineage or its totem, or simply as Ninawak, the people here. 
all the people on this map were Algonquian speaking peoples. Algonquian societies, political systems, and history of relationships are very complex, more complex than Anglo-Europeans cared to understand in many cases. Historically, those complexities spanned around 3,500 years. Algonquian speaking people reached New England from the Great Lakes by around 3,500 years ago. They absorbed or replaced the maritime archaic people who had occupied the Northeast coast for several thousands of years before them. The Algonquians then differentiated into different groups with Western and Eastern Abenaki speaking people competing for dominance on the coast. By around 2000 years ago, Eastern Abenaki speaking people came to dominate. Then by around 1,000 years ago, Western Abenaki speaking people, including the Penacook, prevailed in the Merrimack Valley and expanded to the coast in Essex County. Competition continued between Eastern Abenaki speaking people, such as the Mi'kmaq and Western Abenaki speaking people. And this was a traditional enmity that continued uh, on and ended only with European intervention uh, about 400 years ago. The Penacook and the Pawtucket were pressured by both the Eastern Abenakis, who came to be known as the Tarantines, and by the Iroquoian speaking peoples to the West, especially the Mohawk or the Kanyan Kahaka. The Penacook and their allies as far south as Nantucket were raided by the Tarantines right up until around 1635. Plus, on their Western front, they were defeated in all of their conflicts with the Iroquois throughout the 17th century. Around 500 years ago, Algonquians to the South, including the Massachusetts, became dominant in Southern New England, including Southern Essex County and Southern Middlesex County. At the time, and at the same time, all of these indigenous people were caught in the middle of the competition between the French, Dutch, and English for New England land and resources. So the geopolitics here is very complicated. Indigenous people in New England were all related through marriage, trade, military alliance, and later even by residents as groups were displaced or thrown together during the contact period and after the King Philip's War. Bands paid tribute to larger or more powerful bands or confederacies as part of a system of mutual defense and these were always changing. These are some of the alliances we know about. Before 1600, the Penacook and Pawtucket were members of the Wawanock Confederacy. These were Abenakis living on the coast of Maine. After Bashaba's murder by Tarantines in 1615 or so, the uh, people joined another confederacy under Nana Pashamet. Nana Pashamet was murdered by Tarantines in 1619 at his fort in Medford. And after that, the Pawtucket paid tribute to Nana Pashamet's eldest son, Wanahakwaham or John. After John's death, both Maskinomit and John's mother, uh, the widow Squaw, called, referred to as Squaw Sockham, paid tribute to Passaconaway, the leader of the famous Penacook Confederacy. Passaconaway uh, ultimately abdicated to his surviving youngest son, Wanalancet. And then in 1675, the Penacook Confederacy fell apart uh, because of King Philip's War, which was Metacomet's Wampanoag War against the English. From around 1700 until sometime after the Civil War, it was simply not possible to live openly as a Native American in Massachusetts without risking death, internment, or deportation to slave plantations. Meanwhile, the Algonquian confederacies couldn't protect themselves from their own native enemies on the east and on the west. And this is why they essentially embraced the Europeans. A turning point in the indigenous history of Essex County was in 1644. At that time, Sagamores and Stockhams from Penacook, Pawtucket, Nipmuc, and Massachusetts 
all appeared together in Salem Court before Governor John Winthrop and Reverend Richard Mather to sign an oath. In this oath, they agreed to become Christians, to subjugate themselves to the English, and to remain neutral in any future conflict. The following year, powwows were made illegal. Between 1700 and 1703, descendants in these three lineages signed quitclaim deeds to all the North Shore towns then in existence. Salem, Danvers, Peabody, and Middleton originally were part of Masconomet's jurisdiction, but jurisdiction transferred to Nanapashamit's descendants after Masconomet's death in 1658. The original deeds to Hamilton and Wenham were both signed by Masconomet's grandchildren, the Pawtucket. These are some of the known uh, villages where Pawtucket bands were living at the time of English settlement. These were not in sovereign territories. Um, these were the people who were living in Gloucester Harbor when Champlain visited in 1606, when the Dorchester Company landed at Fisherman's Field in 1623, when Roger Conant led remnants of the Dorchester Company from Fisherman's Field to Namkiag in 1626, when Endicott founded Salem in 1628, when John Winthrop met, met Maskinomet at sea off the Beverly Coast in 1630, when Maskinomet gifted Agawam to John Winthrop Jr. in 1638, when your Enum was founded in 1639, and when Maskinomet was buried in South Hamilton in 1658. They were here. The extinction narrative invents the vanishing Indian or the last Indian and the idea that indigenous people were doomed to become extinct because they were not capable of becoming civilized or modern, no matter how hard the English uh, tried to help them to do so. Um, implicit in this uh, belief uh, was that uh, people uh, should be settled. They should be living on farms with fences. They should be Christian. Uh, they should uh, tame the wilderness. Uh, they should adopt uh, modern, modern uh, uh, ways. Uh, and this was seen. Excuse me, one second. <laughs> I had to let the cat in. <laughs> um, uh, this idea uh, of uh, the the being the first, the English were the first to live here, the histories say they were the first to erect, erect houses, the first to tame the wilderness and so on. Um, and as our uh, 400th year or 350 or 400th year anniversaries approach in the in our various towns here in Essex County, there's a, uh, you know, a desire to uh, talk about how wonderful the first uh, settlers were and all the first things that they did. Um, this idea of being the first and the Indians being the last, this was uh, uh, introduced by the indigenous scholar Jean O'Brien. She coined that phrase for historical texts that focus on the firsts achieved by the English and that either celebrate or lament the last of the Indians. Her book cover shows uh, Poquanum, known as Black Will, who's selling Nahant to Thomas Dexter for a suit of clothes in 1628, in which the indigenous leader is already becoming invisible. We owe a lot to the voices of indigenous leaders, uh, indigenous scholars in re-examining the past. I'm thinking especially of uh, Jean O'Brien, Lisa Brooks, Marge uh, Bruchak, and many others. The extinction narrative includes the claim that uh, colonists tried to help them. The first seal of Massachusetts has a naked Indian with an upside down caption bubble that reads, come over and help us. The downward pointed arrow signifies defeat. The present day Massachusetts state seal, which was created in 1890, uh, from authentic source sources still has the uh, Native American now with clothes, but with still with a downward pointed arrow. 
and over his head is Miles Standish's arm, which is brandishing a, a sword. The Latin and the ribbon says essentially, by the sword, we seek peace and liberty. The Ponkapog Massachusetts seal uses the same image I noticed, but with the arrow pointing up and without the sword. Recently, protest groups started a social justice campaign to change the state seal and flag. And in January 2021, this year, Governor Baker ordered a commission to do just that. It will be very, very interesting to see what they come up with. These are some events in the erasure and replacement process. This included renaming places and declaring groups legally disbanded. Changing names helped to legitimate replacement. Erasure of language and identity began with censorship of speech. Uh, for example, in 1637, after defeating the Pequot in the Pequot War, uh, the colony made it a crime to speak the name Pequot. You could be whipped and fined or imprisoned for simply uttering the word. The Pequot had been massacred at Mystic by joint colonial forces led by John Mason. The few survivors were sold into slavery. They were uh, given to soldiers as spoils of war, distributed among the, the towns, or shipped to plantations in the Caribbean. And the Pequot tribe was declared extinct. The village of Pequot was renamed New London, Connecticut. And the Pequot River was renamed the Thames. In 1690, excuse me, in 1890, Zervaya Gould Mitchell of Lakeville was billed as the last of the Wampanoags, despite the fact that she had 11 children, including two daughters with living descendants today. Her designation had to, uh, as the last, had to do with the concept of racial purity. To be authentically Indian, you had to be pure blooded. And believing there were no more pure blooded Indians left east of the Appalachians, from the mid 19th century on, New Englanders developed a nostalgic and romantic craze for them. We got Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's Hiawatha, The Last of the Mohicans by John Fenimore Cooper. Poems were written by John Greenleaf Whittier. Henry David Thoreau canoed up the Concord. And monuments were erected in town parks throughout the Northeast in, in memory of famous warriors. This is uh, statues of Mas uh, Massasoit, for example, or whose name was actually Usamequin or Yellowfeather, uh, of whom Zervaya uh, and her children were direct descendants. Those statues stand in no fewer than 12 towns today. So there's a, a pattern here at the risk of overgeneralization. You have the first hundred years colonists' general admiration of indigenous people as noble savages. And that this gives way to fears of savagery and of Englishmen becoming savages themselves. Indigenous people became the white man's enemy and then the white man's burden as conquered people. Then over the next hundred years, the narratives of erasure were written and acted upon. Indigenous people came to be seen as obstacles to national progress through manifest destiny. Then in the hundred years following their supposed extinction, Indigenous people were remembered, lionized, and impersonated. They became romantic heroes and tragic victims in literature and in public art. And now in the last 50 years, Indigenous people of New England have been rediscovered as not so vanished at all. After all, uh, politically active, intent on cultural preservation, the restoration of native languages and communities and the repatriation of cultural property. After generations of assimilation with denial or concealment for the sake of safety, New England Indians have finally been rediscovering themselves and celebrating their identities as indigenous people. In my search for the true history uh, of indigenous people in Essex County, I discovered that we cannot really trust the colonial accounts and early town histories and these other sources besides. These are only starting points, places to go for leads to generate research questions. But they repeat the stories from the erasure narratives and they oversimplify, overgeneralize or exaggerate. They also report false or imaginary news or legends that became intertwined into local history. And they omit information, especially information that casts a negative light. 
so-called official histories are especially likely to have been slanted or sanitized. And uh, this has been my, I'm showing you my short list of European primary sources uh, that I found to be reasonably informative or objective. The best ones are people's letters, diaries, and reports to their monarchs or sponsors. For example, in the British Library, I found uh, the existence, or I discovered the existence of a native village in Gloucester through an anonymous report to King Charles I. The report was called, Ye Names of Ye Rivers and Ye Sagamores that Inhabit Upon Them. And it named the uh, Sagamore and village in uh, Gloucester at that time, which would have been in, within the first uh, 10 years of 1600s. But all the sources need to be uh, critically examined. What, what sources do you have for your towns? Enon, uh, later known as Wenham, uh, was set off from Beverly and Salem in 1643. And those who were literate wrote letters home. And what about the Hamlet, which became Hamilton? Historians of Ipswich and York, Maine describe how Nicholas Woodbury of the Hamlet was captured by Abnaki near Cape Nettick in Maine in 1711. He was part of a militia sent to defend the colonists at, at York. The Abnaki took him to Canada and later re returned him for ransom. Were his experiences recorded? Vital records for the Hamlet say there were a number of slaves and indentured servants in 1793, but fewer than 10 Indians at that time. Well, who were they? Are they referred to in minutes of selectmen's meetings? In Gloucester's archives, all reference to indigenous people have been expunged, except for two sentences that they missed in the minutes of selectmen's meetings. In 1682, the selectmen voted to ask the townspeople to distinguish between strange Indians, those displaced by King Philip's war after 1675, and, quote, the Indians who live among us, end of quote. And in 1684, the selectmen voted to ask the townspeople to refrain from acts of vigilantism against, quote, the Indians who live among us, end of quote. There's no record of what happened subsequently. A letter home from a bookseller visiting from England is the only way we learned that the Pawtucket abandoned Duanasquam village for the last time in 1686. The Pawtucket and the English had been planting side by side, more or less peacefully for more than 40 years. So these are some of the steps for unerasing indigenous history, starting with indigenous and physical data rather than with colonial data. Who were the people in your town really? Where did they come from? When were they here? What language did they speak? What did they call themselves? How did they live? Where did they live? How do they make their living here? And what was their relationship to colonists? What physical and documentary evidence attests to their presence in your town? These questions are, are hard to answer because it re requires knowledge from various sciences and also there's so much misinformation out there. The people in Essex County at the time of contact were thought to be Penacook, Massachusetts, Nipmuc, Abnaki, Mass Wampanoag. And of course those peoples Oh, and the Pawtucket were all connected. Uh, and the people have been living there for thousands of years. You can't have people living in one place for thousands of years without being connected. <laughs> it's, it's, it's artificial to try to make distinctions. Um, I think the, the most logical way to make distinctions is on the basis of language. And the people in Essex County uh, spoke a different language than the people in southern and south of Boston. Uh, early explorers commented on the fact that uh, people that the uh, people living on uh, Cape Cod could and the people living on Cape Ann could not could only communicate with each other through a uh, trade patois, a, uh, a pidgin language, and otherwise spoke different languages. They were et ethnically different, even though they were all the same, they were all still different and the same at the same time. 
So um, the next steps are focused on uh, place names and cultural geography. And Algonquian words and reconstructed natural environments are clues to where the people lived and how they used your land and resources. For example, the village of Nomkiag, uh, which is Nomkiag in Massachusetts, but Nahumkiak in Abenaki, most likely referring to eels, which was a favorite food of the bass that spawned on the river by that name, was in North Beverly on the eastern bank of that river, the Bass River, which the Pawtucket called the Wakwak River. It drains Wenham Lake and the surrounding freshwater swamps and empties into Beverly Harbor. The people were growing corn on the lower slopes of nearby hills. They canoed to the Ipswich River via the Miles River. They canoed to the ocean via the Bass River. They trapped beavers at Beaver Pond and they fished for Tom Cod in Frost Fish Brook in the winters. A lot of uh, people mistakenly think that uh, Namkiag was in Beverly, it was in Salem, uh, but Namkiag was in North Beverly and it was John Endicott who moved the seat of that uh, uh, Salem village across the river to what is Salem today. It's a very common error in, the, in all the texts that I see. Old deeds and maps uh, hold clues to the location of native sites. For example, these place names on this schematic were recorded in a 1628 deed of land from Masconomet to John Endicott. The forts and watchtowers on the map were recorded by Edward Winslow, exploring from Plymouth Colony in 1624. As I mentioned before, all of the Pawtucket coastal villages had watchtowers and forts to defend themselves from the Northern Corn Raiders, the Tarantines. I'm not even going to try to pronounce those names, although uh, believe, believe it or not, I really could at one point. <laughs> these uh, are clues. These words are clues. Uh, they often signify historically like the native sites, uh, this, uh, the name of a neighborhood, a street, a hill, lake, pond, or stream. The word castle, for example, typically refers to sites of uh, native forts or watchtowers. And most towns on the coast have a place called Castle Hill or Old Castle. Edward Winslow called them castles because they resembled medieval European fortifications with ramps and moats and turrets, except they were uh, made of wood instead of stone and masonry. Uh, old is another, um, any, anything that was called old in the 17th century was indigenous. The only linguistic clues I found to indigenous settles, uh, settlements in Hamilton Wenham are Old Town Way and Old Country Road, which actually do demarcate the boundaries of a documented uh, indigenous settlement area at the northern end of Wenham Lake, where Wenham Swamp drains into the lake. These are other indigenous settlements in your area, in, in addition to those on the northern and southern shores of Wenham Lake. For example, on Essex River, where it drains Tobacco Lake, on Fish Brook, where it joins the Ipswich River in Topsville, Topsfield, and on the Ipswich River, everywhere where it intersects with Topsfield Road, which was an Indian trail. An archaeological survey conducted in the 1940s by Ripley Bullen mapped around 70 village sites uh, along the Ipswich River alone. And there uh, to the right of the uh, Hamilton place name is Sagamore Hill, where Masconomet and the others are buried. Indigenous landscapes are all around us in plain view, such as this uh, split rock with petroglyphs in Anasquam and this winter solstice sunset in uh, a solar observatory on Pole Hill in Gloucester. Places like Bradley Palmer State Park, Chebacco Woods, Appleton Farms, and Audubon's Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary, these are indigenous landscapes. The trails around the ponds and along the Ipswich were originally made by indigenous people. And do take a good look at all the rocks. Not all the rock piles you see were made by colonists clearing fields or marking boundaries. 
indigenous people gathered that burst fluff of those uh, cattails, uh, those chivaco cattails, to insulate their moccasins for winter or to stuff into their baby's cradle boards for diapering material. The Pawtucket grew corn at Appleton Farms before the Appletons did. In the 1680s, Major Samuel Appleton bought three native captives from the Indian Wars to work his farm. African and indigenous slavery were well-established in Essex County prior to 1700. In 1683, Samuel Simons of Ipswich, John uh, Winthrop Jr.'s brother-in-law, paid five pounds for an Indian boy and girl to serve him as slaves. After discovering as much as I could about indigenous presence, I returned to the traditional primary source. I'm still working on outreach to indigenous historians, which is complicated by ethnographic refusal. There's a long history of resentment against Anglo-European appropriation and distortion of indigenous history and culture, as well as of land and resources. In Algonquian tradition, stories may be the property of particular families. Only certain people may have the right to tell a story. Information may not be readily shared or may not be accurate. and may even be intentionally falsified the way some townies mislaid tourists uh, seeking directions. An example is the Abenaki spokesperson who claimed that Wanapasaki means smile of the great spirit. That's what it says in Wikipedia which assumed that an indigenous source would necessarily be authoritative. However, there is no, having myself made a study of, of uh, proto-Algonquian and Algonquian languages um, that I'm still in the process of, there is no syllable in Winnipesaukee that refers to uh, a smile, a spirit, or greatness of any kind in any Algonquian language. The name means in the vicinity of the lake's outlet. Winnipesaukee village was on the river by that name where it drains the lake. But there are indigenous historians interested in collaboration and in truth finding. And the truth is somewhere in between the respective histories that we have all inherited. Ideally, we would begin by consulting indigenous sources first as a step one for unerasing indigenous history in New England. I hope to locate descendants of the people who lived in Essex County and collect the stories of their ancestors' diaspora experiences. I've traced the Pawtucket diaspora to all these locations. Families began moving away uh, as early as 1644 when the Mass Bay Colony criminalized powwows. Then in greater numbers in 1675 at the start of King Philip's War, uh, most Pawtucket in Essex County crossed the Merrimack River en masse by canoe into New Hampshire and Maine to maintain their neutrality and to escape the fighting. After the war, some Pawtucket relocated to relatives at other villages, including their principal winter village at uh, Lowell, which was Wamiset. Uh, Wamiset had been designated as a praying town for the protection of Christianized Indians. There were praying towns on what was then the frontiers of New England. Diasporas from Wamiset occurred between 1676 and 1695. In 1688, Massachusetts issued its first bounty commissions on Indian scalps. This was a practice that continued off and on up to the revolutionary period and colonists enriched themselves on scalp hunting expeditions. They could get a certain amount of money for the scalps, different amounts for men, women, and children. They destroyed Wamiset in 1695 and surviving Pawtucket fled north to Canada and to the French. Their descendants are at Odenac on the St. Lawrence in Quebec today. Other families sought refuge with the Nipmuc at Hassanamiset, the Natick and Mashpee to the south, the Sokoki and Mrs. Coy on Lake Champlain, and the Penobscot in Old Town in Maine. Some joined the Wampanoag resistance movement in the south. Others joined the Wabanaki resistance movement in the north. 
During the 1700s, the Pawtucket were interned on reservations with Pecumtuck, Mahican, and Katawaki Mohawk people on the Western frontiers at Stockbridge, Scattaquook, and Aquasasne in upstate New York. And after President Andrew Jackson's Indian Removal Act of 1830, remaining indigenous populations in the Northeast were exiled west of the Mississippi. So the Cherokee were not the only Trail of Tears. Pawtucket descendants are on the Stockbridge Muncie Reservation today in Wisconsin. And then after the Civil War, government sanctioned efforts to exterminate the Indians that had begun in 1688 with scalp bounties in Massachusetts were stepped up again and were carried to the indigenous peoples of the West. As late as 1773, on the eve of the American Revolution, Indian scalps were hanging from the rafters of the Salem Courthouse. In that year, magistrates requested that they be removed because of, quote, unsightliness and falling dust, end quote. In 2012, uh, 2010, nearly 19,000 people in Massachusetts self-identified as American Indian. These are some numbers for the towns around here. And the number of people reporting mixed native ancestry was much higher. It's very likely that some are descendants of the indigenous people who lived in Essex County during the contact and colonial periods. This family was photographed on Cape Ann in 1922 by the ethnographer Frank Speck, who summered in Gloucester. They were going dock to dock in a skiff, selling baskets, brooms, and herbal remedies. And the photo on the right was made at Odenac in Quebec sometime prior to 1890. And here are descendants at Odenac today and at these other places on the Stockbridge Muncie Reservation on St. David's Island in the Caribbean. They, these uh, are Penacook Pawtucket who are descendants of, uh, that were shipwrecked uh, on their en route to slave plantations in Bermuda in 1676. And the intertribal powwow scene is, uh, was at Plug Pond in Haverhill sponsored by the Massachusetts Center for Native American Awareness in Danvers. Uh, so it's a complex history. It's a, a mixed up history. Um, but make no mistake, this was their land. If they had had any real choice, it still would be. I believe we have a collective responsibility for social justice and the protection of human rights. And this applies to indigenous people as well, who sometimes need to extend social justice among themselves. It begins with telling truer stories against the long-standing archival power of the narratives of erasure. It includes respect for indigenous peoples and their values and traditions and their diversity. It includes the repatriation of indigenous remains and material culture, the preservation and protection of indigenous sites and ceremonial landscapes, calls for inclusiveness, recognition of groups living and identifying as indigenous people independently of proofs of descent or connections to a particular lineage, independently of the level of complexity of political organization, whether a band, a tribe or a nation, and support for the revitalization of indigenous languages and the prosperity of traditional communities. And at the least, and at the very least, Social justice calls for land acknowledgement. Thank you, I'm done. <laughs> Stop share, all right. There, um, did that make any sense? Yes, thank you very much. That was incredible. Take a breath, get a sip of water. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people. I see some people giving you hand claps in the uh, in the chat. Oh. There, so that's fantastic. Oh, um, we have. I know we're going to have some questions for you, but I'd like to shift gears momentarily and invite Dr. Nez of Navajo Nation to speak. Um, for context, our goal in putting this panel together uh, was to offer a lot of different perspectives from different cultural groups. 
again, with the idea that there's no monolith, right? There is no one story of what it is to be indigenous in America or even in New England. And uh, Mary Ellen, I think it's fair to say there are a lot of different ways to look at, at indigenous history here in New England. So uh, we have questions for at the end, but I'd like to invite Dr. Nez to share any screens or slides he has. And you're visiting us uh, from Arizona. So thank you so much for making the time in your Saturday afternoon to be here with us. And um, I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Ann. Um, do a quick introduction. Um, Shea, uh, Dr. James Nez, a professional title, a professional so my name is Dr. James Nez. Um, I have four clans that I go by. The first clan is uh, Kintlachitni, they say Red House clan. My people, my mother's people, they actually come from the Pueblos um, near Mount Taylor. We were adopted into the Navajo tribe. And so when the Navajos adopted us, they saw that there was adobes that we lived in. And so we became the Red House clan. And my dad is a salt people clan. And then my grandfather is a uh, Nakai, they call it. It's a Central American Indian. Uh, there's a mixture of Hispanic, Comanche, Mescalero, Apache. And then my paternal um, grandfather, he is a Tatne Zahni clan, which is a Tangle Vines clan. Like how in the gardens you go in there and there's all sorts of tangle vines. So those are the four people that I represent. And I just wanted to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to join in and uh, speak to the, to, to the group here. So I wanted to um, go ahead and uh, talk a bit about a few things. Uh, I want to make clear right away that there's two different movements in creating uh, or reestablishing presence of the American Indian people here in the United States. The first movement, I think uh, our, our prior presenter, she covered that quite well it's with a lot of uh, historical content. And the, con the historical content that she's talking about um, was more contemporary within the past few hundred years. The second movement is there's a movement that involves ancient history. That means the holy people's rules and guidance for us as Navajos. We call ourselves Navajos, but that word came from Nabeho. Nabeho came from Nabahitene, warrior people. So we call ourselves so we are the five-fingered people. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the more contemporary history and then also a little more about the uh, traditional history of the Navajos. So the two movements are necessary. These two different ideas of how we need to reestablish ourselves, our presence here uh, within the United States, because a lot of people think that Native Americans are gone, their history right? But they're not. We're not. We're here. You know, we're, we're still here as Native people. And the most important thing that us Native people, um, it's five o'clock, the, the Native people um, should be uh, concerned with is learning about these, the, the ancient history. Because we can make all the all these different things, you know, we can make all sorts of different um, uh, movements and actions uh, on the contemporary side. We can say, we can make the argument, we are still here, we're present, we're, you know, we, we lived in this area at one time within the United States. But if we forget who we are as native people, then we cease to exist today. And so when we look at it, we as Native people have to know, we must know our own history. 
We have to know our clans. We have to know where we came from, where we originated. And then we have to know our language, Nihizad. We have to know those things. We have to know our culture, our ceremonial ways, our songs, our prayers. If we maintain those things, we do not cease to exist. We are here. And so when we talk about contemporary history, it strengthens our presence. But when we talk about ancient history, it strengthens us as native people because we need to continue to maintain our traditions and our culture. And that was something that once upon a time, the United States government tried to do away with. So when we talk about federal Indian policy, there was a time uh, prior to 1868 for the Navajo people when the Navajos negotiated a treaty with the United States government. The United States government said, okay, we're gonna look at the Navajo people as a tribal nation. And they said, there's certain things that come along with that, that we don't bestow upon the Navajos. We call that inherent sovereignty. That means we ourselves have governed ourselves from time immemorial. And we, are, we will continue to do that as native people. So that was the that was the ideology back back in 18 uh, before 1868. Prior to that, we came across the Spanish people, the Spaniards. People came across Spain where I live at in Arizona. This used to be Spain, then it became Mexico, then it became the United States. So we were citizens of three different countries, and yet we maintained ourselves as native people here on Navajo. We said. First, ah, you see, they were Navajos, the Nenitle, and then we're Americans. Okay, so we look at it as a way of maintaining our culture in that sense. Cultural identity is important. So, those of you that are listening, um, you 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 might come across a Native American someday, or in a, uh, wherever that you might reside. And you might think of the, the more romantic idea, right? Long braids, two eagle feathers in their hair, leather and everything. It wasn't always like that. We didn't always dress like that. Us Navajos, we have a different traditional attire. All tribes have different, different attires. And so um, the prior presenter, he was talking about language. All the native tribes, they lived in different areas. Um, they lived next door to each other. They traded with each other. <clears throat> and yet they didn't speak the same language. Same way with us Navajo, next door to us, we have the Hopi tribe. We have the Utes. We have the Mescalero Apaches. They're our cousins. We kind of speak a similar language with each other, Athabascan language. And so why is it that, you know, all these native people, they live together and yet they can't speak to one another in, in a common language? It's because native people moved all the time. We moved. We were hunters and gatherers. We moved where all the, the, the animals went. We moved where there's water. If it was a drought in one area, we moved to a different area where there's water. So when we talk about land and we always, the, 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 the ideology today, the thinking today is this land is mine. And even with the, 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 the title of the presentation today, all land is indigenous land. If you were to talk to a really traditional uh, uh, Navajo, they would say, it's not like that. Because this land doesn't belong to us. We only live upon it for a certain amount of years that the great creator gives us. And then after that, the next generation lives upon it. That's the way it was way back in the olden days. So that's why we moved around. We didn't say this is Navajo land. This is Apache land. This is a, we said, we said, this land is our mother. So when we talk about land ownership, it's not like that. The land is the one that supports us because the land is our mother and we are her children. No matter what 
nationality you come from, you are the Mother Earth's child. And so when you go and you walk upon the land, you don't say, this is my land right here. You say, that's my mother right there. Shema, my mom, help me out right here. I'm hungry. She will give you food. I'm thirsty. She will give you water. Where does that come from? The heavenly father, the sky, rains down upon the earth. And they, the mother and the father, they're the ones that provide these things to us. They maintain us. They sustain us. And so wherever you go in the world, whether if you're, if I went to France, if I went to England, if I went anywhere all over the world, and I set foot on that land, that land is my mother. And so that's the way we look at it as native people. Now, today, when you, when you factor in the other, the other nationalities, how they think about these kind of things, that's when you get ownership. I own this land. I own this property. But you really, you're only, you're only setting foot on it for so many years. And you should be really glad and appreciate that. And you should give thanks about that. Every day, I'm going to walk really good on this earth, this beautiful mother earth, and I'm going to walk below this beautiful father sky. And together, that's where life is at. Okay? So think about it. Really think about it. We're only here for so long. We hope to have a life, long life, right? Um, Navajos, we're supposed to say, we say that we try to make it to 102 years old. Toba on. Maybe even further. And so um, you really have to look at it. That idea of land ownership, that's not native. That comes from somewhere else. Ha, the shame, maybe it's the Vilakana, the, the non-Indians. They think about it that way. Conquest, right? The doctrine of conquest. That goes back to federal Indian policy. We conquered people and now we own their land. Okay, that wasn't how we thought about it. When the other people came across the ocean, we welcomed them, we traded with them, we fed them, we ate with them. And so we talk about being five-fingered people, right? Navajos are not the only people that have five fingers, right? Every human being has five fingers. When we shake hands, we shake hands as relatives. That's called eh, that's called kinship. And so when we shook hands from the people that came, shook hands with people that came from across the ocean, we embraced them as relatives. And they abuse that. And so there's an idea of, there's this word that is always thrown around in American Indian uh, uh, history, policy, um, thinking today, decolonization. They say, let's decolonize. I don't like that word. Decolonization means by definition, if you look it up, it means a colony from another sovereign that came here, they declared independence. They said, we're not part of that nation anymore. Us colonies, today we're, we're independent. That's what the United States did, right? They came across and they said, we set up 13 colonies. And then they signed the declaration and they said, now we're sovereign. Now we're independent. That's decolonization. Now, when you talk about Navajo um, freedoms and, and Navajo um, sovereignty, there's a better word to use, retraditionalizing, meaning that we're going to know our language, we're going to know our prayers, we're going to know our songs, we're going to know our culture, we're going to know our history, all the way back from the time when the holy people gave those to us when the holy people were here, when they lived, when they made mistakes, and when they passed all of those um, behazani onto us, those guiding principles. And so we, when we learn those, we become retraditionalized. We become free from the thoughts of those that have come, come across the ocean and said, this is how things are now, the doctrine of conquest. 
if you can learn your language and if you can learn your indigenous culture and if you can learn your songs and prayers and everything, you are free. That is independence. Okay, so we can work things on the top level. We can say, you know, we need to learn what the what the Bilagana did to us. But when I say Bilagana, it means the non-Indian. When the Bilagana, uh, what they did to us, we can learn that all day long, and it's important. But we, the Nani Dlinigi, the the Nani Dlinigi, us, us, us Native people, we must, we must maintain our traditional knowledge also, so we will continue. And so, um, <clears throat> I wanted to make a, a point that Native people, we call ourselves, but uh, since we're brown people. That's the way we call all Native people. And when we practice our ceremonies and when we speak our language, we're re-traditionalizing. We're not saying that we're becoming independent as a tribal nation. We were always independent. We were always sovereign. We were, we have, the, even the federal government and federal Indian policy they, they identify that, they recognize the inherent sovereignty of us as a tribe to govern ourselves and all of our internal affairs. And so when we talk about that retraditionalizing, we talk about the strength of many generations back. Grandma, great grandma, great, 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 all the way grandpa, all of these people, we're bringing them to the forefront. We're bringing all of their teachings here that, that these teachings come from the holy people. And so we really have to be, um, we really have to recognize that also, that portion of it. When we talk about anything that has to do with human rights, it's not only federal Indian policy. It's not only the contemporary history, but it is the essence of the native people that we have to consider also. So that's what I wanna share with um, the group. Just know there's two different there's two different movements in creating reestablishing re presence. There's the analysis of contemporary history, and then there's also the the knowledge of the ancient history of our people. Okay, so my I'll, I'll close by saying that um, my grandma. She shared a story with me one time. She said, "It is Navajo prophecy <clears throat> that someday." The Bilaganas, they're going to come to us and they're going to say, what makes you Navajo? Because they're going to say to us, where is your prayers? Where is your songs? Where is your language? Where is your culture? You wear regular shirts like us Americans. You wear glasses like us Americans, right? You have a cell phone like us Americans. What makes you a Native American? What makes you a, a Navajo? And what's going to save us is our clans. When we have that clan structure in there and we know it and we can practice it and implement it in our daily lives, we will always be Navajo. And so here on Navajo, they stress that all the time. Know your clans. Make sure that you're, if you're going to marry somebody, you're not marrying into the same clan. It's a very complex structure, and it's all based on keh. Keh is often translated as kinship, but it's way more than that. You can't even, you can't even define it. It's something that you live. It is something that the changing woman, who is our mother, she's the one that put it here for us to live by. And that's our saving grace in the future. And so Navajos, we've been here. We've survived the Spaniards. We survived the Mexicans. We survived the Americans. And they've always looked at ways to deal with us. You know, in 1868, we signed a treaty with them. And it says on there, the first thing, we will make no more war. Put down your weapons. And so and we'll give you certain um, crops, uh, seeds, and, and livestock. You guys stay on the reservation and be pastoral agricultural people. So we changed a bit as Native people. After that, after 1868, 
they said, okay, this is not working. They're, they're, they're strengthening, uh, being in one area on one reservation, they're becoming too strong. Their, their language is strong. They're, even they used our language in, in, the, in one of the world wars, Navajo code talkers. That's how strong our language is. And they said, okay, let's, let's, let's make it a federal Indian policy that now let's assimilate them into the United States, all the common people. You, there's no more Indian reservation. There's no more nation. You're going to become an American. That didn't work. They couldn't break that connection with our culture. And so they reorganized it. And they said, let's give all the native people land. Let's give them allotments. And let's, let's let them feel land ownership. Let's make them like us and say, let's teach them that land belongs to them. And they couldn't do that. They couldn't teach the native people that. It was a concept that we don't, we don't understand in our culture, land ownership. Land use, we can understand. And then they said, okay, let's reorganize the tribes and let's let them govern themselves. Let's, let's let them have self-determination. And that's the, that's the state we're in right now, federal Indian policy. With the Navajo Nation, we are a sovereign, dependent nation, they call us. That's our status with the United States. And so we handle our own issues. We have our own court system. I'm a tribal court advocate. I practice law here on the Navajo Nation. We have our own police department. We are a police force. We have our own legislative, executive, judicial branch. We have 110 chapters, subunits of the Navajo Nation. Our reservation is 16, over 16 million acres large within the state of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. And so we are a land-based nation. So you cannot decolonize a, a nation that exists, right? We were never a colony. We cannot declare independence because we have always been in, independent. And so that's something that uh, um, an outsider to the, to the Navajo people that you should know next time you come across somebody and they ask you about uh, the Indian problem. We were never a problem. You know, we always governed ourselves. We've always hunted. We've always gathered. We were always independent. Now we had a little, a little uh, misstep along the way coming into contact with the Bilagana. But we get it. We got up from that misstep. And we re-traditionalize. We, re we understand our ways. And so we become stronger people that way. Hotel, I want to share that um, story with you, and I'll end it there. If you have any questions, I'm always open to uh, answering. Nana. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nez and Ms. Um, Lapunka. So um, I have a few questions we're going to run through. I think they started off easier, and then they get harder. And then um, I think we'll have time at the end if there's anyone in the audience that has specific questions and things that they would like to ask of our panelists, or perhaps even talk amongst ourselves. Um, one of the um, goals of the Human Rights Coalition is to sort of have a really hyper-local conversation about what do these issues mean to us. And part of the goodness of bringing in other voices is that we hear each other and we talk to each other. Um, and so I think there's there's I, before we get into it, I'll just say I'm struck by all the things that we do not know, um, both me individually and perhaps us as as, um, as non-Indigenous people. So I feel like I, my brain is exploding and I'm having a hard time thinking about questions. So I'm glad I wrote them down in advance. So um, this one is sort of to the both of you to begin with. Uh, there's much discussion about the quote unquote correct language to describe Indigenous communities and it's changed over time. We've had Indian, American Indian, Native American, Native peoples, Indigenous peoples, First Nations, First Peoples, and then obviously thousands upon thousands of individual tribal names and same um, name places. So what descriptions do you think are the most culturally inclusive and correct? And how, how best to use the right language to show respect and inclusion in contemporary times? Um, I'd say, Calling the tribes by the individual names would be the best way. A um, lot of the tribes got names, um, just for example, like I said, ours is Navajo. 
If you read in the book where Navajo comes from, they'll tell you it's a Tewa Pueblo name. Mispronounced, but it's it's not. When the when the Americans came to us, they asked us who we are. We said Nabahi Dana, meaning that we're warrior people. We use a warrior name. But in a, when we have um meaning good way, we call ourselves the children of the holy people. But when we encountered uh, another group of people that might harm us, we use a warrior name. So we said, and they said, and they said, they called us that. So Nabeho became Navajo. And so it's actually They don't ask us that. They just go ask our neighbors, how come they call them Navajos, right? So I would say, uh, learn the traditional names of the um, tribes. And if you don't respectfully use their mispronounced name, right? Um, even the Americans, the Spaniards are the ones that told us there's Americans coming from the east. And when the when the Navajos heard American, they, the Spaniard, they said Americano. And so Americano, we couldn't say that. So the Navajos mispronounced it and they said Bilagana. So Americano became Bilagana. So it's a mispronunciation of those names. So um, really, uh, I would say use their traditional names. You go to some of these other places, they'll even ask you to call them. Um, they, they, they'll, they'll, they don't like being called by their names. Like if you came to Navajo, they always say, you don't say your own name. You know, you, usually you'll call somebody by how you're related to them. So for example, I have a, my, one of my brothers is married to a Bilagana. So she becomes Nihijaat, meaning our, our female uh, in-law. So all Bilagana, we can call them that, Nihijaat. And so they become related to us in that way. Hmm. Interesting. Mary Ellen, any thoughts on that in your research as you've studied language over time? Oh, I think you're muted, sorry. Um, I saw a video in which uh, uh, indigenous uh, teenagers were interviewed on what they wanted to be called. Um, they were quite emotional about it. Uh, and they said that they did not want to be called Native American because they didn't, they rejected the identity as American. They wanted to be more, but they also didn't want to be called natives because of its association in colonial literature. Um, so they chose indigenous people. In, in Canada, I think first peoples was chosen as the preferred term and still is to, to the best of my knowledge. But I, I agree with Dr. Nez that uh, it's best to refer to people by their, by their actual group name or by their uh, kinship relationship, which mm -hmm. is how, they, how indigenous people refer to each other. Mm -hmm. This is true in many other cultures as well. Uh, when I was in uh, Botswana in Africa, I addressed all uh, older females as mother and all older, older males as father. So um, the, the idea of kinship is important. And, and I think that Dr. Nez's point about uh, in, indigenous people's relationship to the land was very, very well taken. Uh, the idea that land is not something that you own or that you commodify or chop up. Um, and there was a, a, there's a feeling of disbelief about it. It's like the first time you learned that you could buy a square foot, you could buy air by the square foot above a highway to develop commercially. Mm -hmm. And when you first hear this, you go, what? <laughs> what? No way can you buy air, you know? Uh, to build on, but and and so it was the same kind of um, disbelief when it became clear that uh, colonists were looking to um, uh, to per to commodify land in that way. And I, I think that the distinction that Dr. Nez makes between retraditionalization and decolonization that's that's brilliant. I think that's really right on. That's basically the traditionalization is what's what's uh, important. 
Okay, so both of you um, touched quite a bit on land and land acknowledgements, um, and that's something that's been a really, uh, really sort of, um, I don't want to say controversial, but it is a little bit controversial. So, you know, land acknowledgements have become increasingly common in municipalities, school districts, universities, even public conventions. I even think the Oscars started with the land acknowledgement just, you know, a month or so ago. Uh, yeah. But in some places, resistance is still high to sort of a simple statement of, of understanding um, other people have come before us. So what do you say to those who protest acknowledgements as either unnecessary or in some cases invoke objections like the doctrine of discovery or manifest destiny as a rationale to not offer them? Um, what I say, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, in a sense, it's, it's true. Um, I mean, you, it isn't necessary. It, it's, uh, it is an expression, it's, a, it's an expression an expression that's an outreach of a desire for social justice. Um, it's very pale in comparison to what act, act social justice actually would mean, but it is a token. And that, that might be one reason for not being uh, thrilled with it. It's a very small thing, really. In another sense, it's a very big thing. But um, I think that the doctrine of discovery, uh, that that's a very European concept. You know, the explorer arrives and plants his flag on some beach somewhere and declares this is now ours. Um, there are other people who say that if the, if the Indians sold land or gave land or signed deeds, that they were giving up ownership of it and that therefore there doesn't need, need to be that kind of acknowledgement. Um, the weight of history is, is on the side of uh, recognizing what was done to the people who were living here for thousands of years, possibly tens of thousands of years. Uh, and uh, within, you know, within two or three generations, they were uh, dispossessed of their, uh, their livelihoods and their lives and their living spaces. Um, and it's, I don't know, I, I'm reminded of the Turkish uh, president who said that, uh, that he would acknowledge the Armenian genocide when Americans acknowledged their genocide of, of Native Americans. And I thought, oh God, he's right on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good point. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but land acknowledgement is a way of acknowledging that, uh, that, there was, that, that, that it was an appropriation of land, land that was gotten uh, by, uh, by means that were harmful to other people. I, I don't know what else to say about <laughs> Well, I'll ask you, Dr. Nez, so when groups offer land acknowledgements, how do you, how do you, how do you feel about them and their necess necessity? And I think actually in our conversations, we've agreed they're very tokenist. It's a super, it's not superficial in the sense that it's not meaningless, but it's it's words and the real thing that's going to make a difference is action and changes sure. of behavior and and re-education and re-traditionalizing and curriculum and those things so it's sort of like a starting point but it's certainly not the be-all end-all it's not like you can say oh I gave my acknowledgement I'm good now right I've, I've made I've made mm -hmm. amends so how do you feel about people who are offering acknowledgements and how do you sort of incorporate that into a step one of of reframing the past and sort of trying to to build on something good I think land acknowledgements makes us feel good, you know, not us native people, but the person that's acknowledging it, you know, they'll, the person gets up there on stage and says, hey, this was Navajo land, was, you know, uh, it makes them feel good to say that, to acknowledge it, that something was somebody's at one time, you know, just like if you, if you had bought a vehicle, you drove it around and you got it repoed and then somebody sold it to someone else and said, this was Anna's car at one time, you know, <laughs> what, what good does that do? I'm going to take it from a traditional um, point of view. We need to start acknowledging land as our mother first. So when we pray in Navajo, the first thing that we say is, and then the second thing says, meaning that we acknowledge the land and say, it, let it be good right here on our mother earth and let it be good right here below our father's sky. 
That's how we always start our prayers. And so when we acknowledge that land as our mother, that means a whole lot more than acknowledging it as somebody else's land that was theirs. Yeah. So when we say that, we should start saying that, you know, look at how we're gathered here on this beautiful mother earth, on this beautiful day, below this beautiful sunshine yeah. and take and mean it too and take care of it. Yeah. You know, just it's just very just similar pray. in Algonquian traditions. Uh, the Algonquians begin their prayers with reference to the four cardinal directions and reference to Mother Earth and Father Sky. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. very, very uh, powerful for Algonquian people in the East too. And and we should we should walk that walk. You know, we yeah. should if we say beautiful Mother Earth, take care of it. While holding on to this. We only get one mother, right? Yeah. We only get one father. Take care of them. You know, don't, in your daily life, incorporate that. Use less, um, make less, less waste. Make sure you use water efficiently. Don't go outside and just start spraying each other for fun, you know. Use it <laughs> yeah. for purpose, purposefully. Yeah. When you do that, then you're being respectful. Then you're 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 walking the walk. You're saying, "My Mother Earth, I love you," you know, and that means a whole lot more than saying that used to be Anna's car, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, what you've touched on is was really important. So when we developed our land acknowledgement, it was in consultation with the Massachusetts tribe. Um, and Thomas Green meant to be here today, but he had an unexpected change of plans and couldn't be here. But one of the things you both just touched on was really part of it is present tense is important it can't only be past tense because that's just another sort of promulgation of the erasure. So um, the language that we use was given to us from them and it was meant to say purposely, people are still here. Like you said, Dr. Ness, we're still here. People are still here. And so that, you know, present tense is um, really, really important and sort of hearing from the, the groups who have these ancestral ties to the land. Um, but that does bring me to the next question, which you both have touched on. So how do you overcome these European attitudes of ownership and um, shifting historical alliances, omissions and biases in the colonial record. I know Mary Owens talked about that a lot. And you know, even today there are online data sources, right? There are data bots that you can type in and say, whose land am I on? Which we've now, both of you have helped unpack that that's a flawed, it's, a, it's not the right question to ask, right? It's a flawed question. It's a question driven from a European sentiment. But how do you reconcile all of these sources of people trying to do the right thing and acknowledge in present tense, and yet the data itself, as Mary Ellen, I think, pretty well illuminated, is very complicated. And historically, the alliances are shifting. How do you reconcile these notions of ownership and respect and acknowledgement with the fact that data itself is confusing and overlapping and the questions are driven from a European sentiment to begin with. What tools can we what tools can we do to make that better? I I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that. I think um, educating people about the what's faulty about their preconceptions about uh, ownership and land that that's a that's a first step people often don't even think about it. I certainly was surprised during my research to gradually uh, you know, have the realization that this was a completely different way of seeing the world uh, that was just completely different from uh, any uh, Anglo-European perspective. And to learn to, and to respect that is, is crucial. Uh, and, and I think people being educated about the different, different worldview um, I mean, if, well, there are lots of examples, but uh, if, if among the Algonquians, their, their lives are, are spiritual. They really do live or did or do, and some still do live spiritually every day and um, conduct their lives according to ancient values that they maintain. Uh, and um, it, it includes acknowledging spiritual entities. And um, uh, I, I know that around uh, here, and I'm sure out West as well, there, there's, uh, you know, prior to the forced Christianization of indigenous people, their religion was based on animism. 
and it included having uh, endowing uh, things like uh, trees and rocks with um, spiritual um, power or Manitou and um, having respect for those things and interacting with them spiritually is important, but it's very difficult for Westerners to understand. Uh, and, and what happened is that a lot of the Native Americans who became Christianized selected one of the Manitou to associate with the Judeo-Christian God and uh, lost touch with the original way that they expressed their spirituality. And it, it tends to now be very much a syncretism of Christianity with the with elements of the earlier religion uh, or the traditional, the ancient religion. And, um, but, but getting people to understand that would help them to understand the relationship of people to the land or to the earth. Uh, so I think education is a, is a, a very significant step um, to help people see things differently, <clears throat> see mm -hmm. things through another lens. All right, so this next one, James and I, the first time we spoke, he told me a really funny story and I thought about it a lot. So this is shifting gears a little bit from the heaviness of acknowledgement and um, attitudes about earth and land. This question, many school districts, universities and professional sports teams are recognizing the negative legacy of cultural appropriation and have begun a process of changing or revising mascots in school or teams imagery, in, including the Massachusetts state flag. But in some cases, community backlash has been intense and those efforts have proven unsuccessful. And this is true in a community near us just this year in Wakefield, Massachusetts. So what are your thoughts about mascot overhauls and cultural appropriation politics today? Good, good question. Uh, uh, we had a good talk about that, right? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that uh, one of our tribal members here on Navajo, uh, Amanda Blackhorse, you know, Bless her for all her efforts. Um, she went up and she filed a uh, lawsuit against the uh, NFL for using the uh, Redskins uh, name. And, you know, my, my personal take on that is that way back in the day, you know, pe okay, people today, they think red skin, right? They think somebody that has red skin and you call somebody by that name and they say, oh my God, that's racist, you know? Um, but we often refer to that, you know, we say black people or white people, still people, you refer to each other by the color of their skin. But in this instance, um, red skin, that's one of the names of one of my relatives, my great grandmother, not because she was a very dark red skinned person, but because she was a light skinned person who needed protection from the sunlight. And so when she was going, when she went out um, on her horse chasing her livestock, she needed a sunscreen. And of course, way back in my great great grandma's time, there was no sunblock, right? There was no what a SPF 14 or anything like that. But what she had was a thing called chi. It's red ochre. She put that in a mixture of um, a fat, a lipid animal fat. And what she did was she rubbed it all over her skin. And so people noticed that during the winter time, her fair skin, again, the, the uh, cold, the breeze would get onto her skin and really dry it out. So even during the winter, when she went out, she would put that sand, that red uh, sand on her, her face. And so her name became a Sanchi, which is a red skinned woman. And so my grandma's name was Red Skin Woman. So it, you have to learn the history of a name before you start to protest against it. What does that mean to us native people? What does Red Skin mean? Well, you know, this is the story behind it. But today, and, and um, I, I say this with all respect to my, my fellow native people who do not live on the reservation, these urban Native Americans, they only tend to, to look at what people tell them, okay? What's in a book, what other historians say, how these names came about, but they do not refer to their, to their people. 
and they don't they don't learn the stories behind it. That's one of the most essential things to know. And yet they they use it as a they say they think of it as a derogatory term. Oh my goodness, you call me a redskin, you know. And me and my brother, we were talking about this uh, at one time. And I said, do you know any derogatory Native American names? Uh, we were trying to think of some and we couldn't think of any. But you, we, when we went, we went online and says derogatory names for Native Americans came up wagon burners, redskins, and a bunch of these other names. And they're all, we've never heard them here on Navajo, you know. <laughs> Uh, I don't think we did that. We probably raided people, but we probably took what, what was in their wagons and we didn't burn it, you know. Um, and so there's a history to it. Our own people, my grandmother was a redskin woman. So it doesn't bother me. It, do, it really does not bother me when I hear that word redskin. Um, and then the other one is, I, I've heard this other uh, name, savage. It doesn't really bother me because there's also a name to that. And, and, and um, the other thing that, uh, you know, you really look at the, the origins of these words. And even um, heathen, you know, from what I was told, the history of the word heathen came from uh, the word for fire worshiper. You know, heathen. When they called us heathens, they called us fire worshipers because native people sat around the campfire at night. We taught, we told stories, we laughed, we sang, we prayed, we did all of these things around our grandpa and grandma fireplace. And the, the Bilicana saw that and they said, oh my God, they're fire worshipers. You know, where did that, where did that word come from? Heathen. Now, way back in the day, there used to have, they used to have single room homes, right? Cabins. And when, when in the cabin, there used to be a big stone, like a, like a fireplace. They used to call that the hearth, right? So people sat around there, even the Bilagana, they sat around there. They used the light from the hearth. They cooked on the hearth. They kept warm by that hearth. And that's where the term heart came from. So when you see those little signs, right? Um, the kitchen is the heart of the home because we sat around that hearth. And so we sat around that fire as native people. So we're heathens, you know, we're, 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 we, we, we sit around our grandpa, grandma fire. That's not derogatory to me, you know, because it is true. The, the kitchen is the heart of the home, that hearth that we all sat around, not as native people also, but as human beings, we sat around that campfire. We kept warm. We cooked. We told stories. We talked to one another. That's how we developed as humans. So you really have to know the history behind all of these terms and these uh, names. You, when you know them, you can speak about it intelligently. And you can say, this is what it means to us Native people. But when you hear a name, you can get angry. I'll give you an example. Back in, in school, I didn't know what... Um, Ayoinchnez meant in Navajo. But I heard my name in there, Nez, Ayoinchnez. And this girl would always used to say that to me. She says, James Nez, Ayoinchnez, you know. And then I'm like, oh my goodness, she's picking on me. And I used to get mad at that girl. And then until I came home and I asked my grandma, what does Ayoinchnez mean? And she goes, that means really tall. And I said, so my name means tall? She goes, yeah, Nez means tall. And I said, so the girl was the same. James Nez is really tall. James Nez, the only Nez. But my initial reaction was, she's picking on me, you know. So uh, that girl and I are still good friends today. So, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, know what you're talking about. Know what these names are. Know where they come from, and you can talk on it like that. Would you say, I want Mary Ellen to answer too, because I know that, you know, it sounds like you're indicating some of uh, these concerns about cultural appropriation and sort of mascot revisions are not necessarily driven by indigenous peoples and or perhaps there's a difference between certain communities. You said you talked about sort of urban, urban groups having a different feeling about things in other places. Would you say there's like a regional variation there or is it custom I, to I, custom or? I think uh, in, in New England, um, there's been 
you know, a lot of appropriation of Native American images, and and some of them really are offensive. I know the the high school I went to uh, in Winchester uh, was on the Aberjona River, and they had an a, a what they called an Aberjona Indian as their mascot, and this was a cartoon figure with buck teeth and uh, not a, not not very attractive, and with the the uh, obligatory feathers coming out of the of the back and uh, they have changed that other communities have co resisted having changing the names um, and and it can be painful i know i was giving a talk at a, a school and explaining to them how they did not in fact have vikings in their town and they were very upset because their football team was called the vikings <laughs> And they didn't want it to be that there hadn't been any Vikings there, but um, but I think that um, you know I think that 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 it's important to re respect. I mean, I think the worst expression of the appropriation of indigenous identity was in uh, the International Order of Red Men, the Red Men's Association, and these were white men who dressed up as Indians. Uh, they would wear uh, false hair, feathers. They would uh, meet around a council fire. And they were active throughout the 1800s. And in fact, the one in Gloucester here, Wingersheek tribe number 12, was not disbanded until 2009. Uh, and then grudgingly, they saw themselves as trying to preserve the traditions, the rich traditions of the vanished Indian. The, the Indians who had disappeared. And of course in New England, they're much less visible than out in Arizona and Utah and, and so on. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and uh, the females were the order of Pocahontas. And uh, they, um, they were prominent in parades. I remember from my own childhood, the red men would be in the parade. They'd have breech clouts and tomahawks and they would uh, kidnap girls from the sidewalk and make them walk in the parade and pretend to scalp the boys and so on and whoop and wall holler and whatever, all the stereotypes. And at the time, everyone regarded it as great entertainment, uh, cl clowning, people clowning around. And it's only later with a little bit of education and introspection that you realize how offensive that kind of behavior is, that kind of imitation and appropriation. Even something like uh, the Walt Disney production of uh, Pocahontas uh, is, is disturbing because Pocahontas is, she's sexy and she, she's expressing American values rather than indigenous values throughout. And yet she's being presented as representing uh, Algonquians of the Del Mar Peninsula uh, or you know wh where uh, Captain John Smith landed down there in Virginia. And, um, and she, you know, this, there are stereotypes, uh, the birds love her, the birds and the animals come to her just like in Snow White. Uh, so it's, it's a, uh, there are different levels and types of appropriation and uh, misuse of indigenous identities. And, uh, and we just need to be educated about those and you know, avoid them, certainly avoid stereotypes. I think uh, one, one advice that was given in a presentation I participated in earlier in the week by an indigenous uh, participant was, it was for teachers on how to teach indigenous history uh, in K-12 public schools. And the, I, I'm afraid I can't remember the name of the speaker, but he said, well, rule number one, no costumes, <laughs> no dressing up in costumes, no reenactments of Thanksgivings, no, you know, and he went through a list of, of things that he thought were objectionable that uh, elementary school teachers should not do in their classrooms. Uh, so we, we need to be guided in this and then, you know, and then do the right thing. Well, that's a good, that's a good segue to the next question I have, um, Anna, which is all Anna. about, oh, sorry. Anna. Could, yes. I, could I say something on that real quick before of you course. move on to the next one? Of course. Um, if, you, if you were to um, bring a mascot here on Navajo and parade that mascot around among, uh, in front of the native people here, maybe more the, the elders, let's say, 
if you brought somebody in a red skin mascot or anything like that, I think the only response they would have was they would say, you know, that means they're, they're crazy. You know, they would look at it as that person's just crazy. And so they, I don't think the elders would take offense to it. Like, oh my goodness, you know, red skin. It would just be funny. It'd be like, the kiss, you know. Uh -huh. But I think it, it varies. Like I said, urban natives um, tend to take it in a in a different light. They they they're more offended by something like that. Uh -huh. um, if you really, if you get if anybody gets a chance, um, go to the First Church of Winham's website. I did a uh, farewell little speech uh, to Mike, uh, Pastor Mike Duda, and um, I talked about one of my. Uh, stereotypes again um, you know when it when it came to interacting with the uh, Bilagana and what I learned about that and how uh, the mission trips that they've taken out this way has um, helped me understand them also their people and so uh, we all have stereotypes and it's not a native thing and it's not a, a Bilagana thing it is a human thing and us humans, we have a nature. We like to dominate each other. We like to uh, make fun of each other. We, we like to do these things. That's the nature of the beast, I call it, right? And even if you look at animals, they do the same thing. I, I, have a, a small, I have a ranch here. And on my ranch, I have sheep. And there's always one bully sheep that will beat up all the other sheep. You call the herd, you take that one bully out and you go and you take it and remove it from the corral. There will rise up another bully. Now, recently I started raising chickens also, my spare time, my hobby. But I have eight chickens out in the little chicken corral and it's the same thing. There's a pecking order and humans have a pecking order also. Now, us humans, because we can communicate, we do it a little more civilized, right? Supposedly. And so it becomes that. It becomes the natural essence of human beings to be prejudiced, to be initially prejudiced, and to be initially offended because we have certain defense mechanisms as human beings. And so it's not, it's not part of just a race. It's not a racial thing. It's a human thing. And so as human beings, as human relatives, we have to know, we have to learn these things from each other. And I, I didn't get a chance to answer the prior question, but how are things, how are we going to teach others? How are others going to learn about this? It happens in these kind of situations. Like right now, there's 19 people on, on this um, uh, Zoom meeting here, presentation. One, two, three, maybe even four, maybe even all of them. They'll take this information, what they learned here today, and they'll tell their families and I always tell this, I teach for a, uh, a college out here, Diné College. I'm part of the adjunct faculty team. And I, oh, I teach Navajo culture. And I always tell my students, what you hear today, go home. Tell your family what, at dinner what we were talking about here. Tell your family what you learned about Navajo culture. They're going to tell other people too. That's how we spread the word. That's how we spread knowledge. And so that's what we do here today. And you think, well, 19 people, that's not gonna make a change. Yes, it will. 19 people will turn into 40 people, to 60 people, to 100 people, to 1,000 people. And so we spread the word that way. And so try not to, um, you know, with the thinking of social justice, we try to, we really look at it and we try to group everybody. That's the first thing we do, we group everybody and we say, these are underserved, these are, you know, abused, and these are the, these are the elite. But in the olden days here on Navajo, we used to share. If we see somebody that doesn't have a dinner, that doesn't have food, we would invite them over, cook for them. Here, my relative, have something to eat and have something to drink. That's how it was. We never left anybody out. That's, eh, that's part of our eh, system. We help each other. That's how it is. When, when we, we, that's how it should be with humans also. Help each other. Talk to each other. 
you know, learn about each other. Because it's like that, even in a family, right? We can all be the same race, but we're all going to have different ways of thinking. That's the story that we tell here on Navajo. All the brothers, they're all going to go to, to different homes eventually. But we come back when it's ceremony time, you know? And so that's, that's the way we should look at it also. Teach each other, learn from each other. And then we become good relatives. Well, I think um, I want to pick up on two things you said there before we kind of bring up to our last questions that have come up as recurring themes also in coalition events. Um, one is this idea, you know, everyone has biases, every single person. And if someone says they don't have biases, it's sort of like people say they don't have mice in their house. You know, everyone does. Like, you may not be able to admit it. So one of the things we've been working on is really getting people to embrace that. And what you said, Dr. Nez, about just really listening and recognizing where people are coming from in terms of their differences and their traumas. I think one, one thing that has come up in conversations about appropriation or tokenism or jokes, you know, if you think about the legacy of that, you know, it used to be acceptable to tell sexist jokes, racist jokes, homophobic jokes, right? Everyone's like, oh, I'm just joking around. It's no big deal. And I think what's become more apparent over time is that behind that quote unquote joke, there is real trauma and there's real pain and there's real violence. And I think one of the things that, you know, has come up for our group, both on this topic, but other topics is that it might seem like a joke to someone, but when the action behind it is genocide or murder or denial of rights and things like that, then it's not really a joke, you know? And so I think it's difficult sometimes to talk about some of these issues without sort of separating, was it, what's the legacy and not just the historical legacy, but what's the present day legacy and is, you know, humanity being furthered by those biases, by those stereotypes, by those jokes, you know, is it actually making life better? So um, that's sort of my segue to the last kind of, kind of last two questions we'll put together. Um, and then we can continue on as long as people are able. And I know the audience hasn't had a chance to talk yet. So uh, these next two questions are kind of together. What are your future goals and concerns about the teaching of Indigenous history in schools, um, in, you know, American schools? What kind of curriculum reforms did you see? And then related to that is more and more communities start to recognize and, and embrace these legacies, have these conversations. Um, and James, you'll be gratified to know, I know a lot of people are going to watch the recording of this. So the 19 people will definitely get to be bigger. So as we start to have these conversations and talking about loving each other and loving the mother earth, is healing really possible? How do we look forward? How do we look to the future and try to reconcile the past and acknowledge what happened? But how do we build on this to make the future better for those of us who are still here? And I know that's a bit philosophical and like a Hallmark question, but that's yeah. how my brain works. I think it, it, it goes back to, again, like what you're talking about, putting their jokes, stuff like that. People tell jokes because they're they're ignorant to certain things. Ignorant meaning not that they're stupid, but that they just don't know. So when people tell jokes like that, people shouldn't, I, I don't think you should be offended. I mean, I've heard some pretty wild jokes, but I told the people, hey, let me tell you something about that. I'm, I'm a storyteller. So I'll sit there for hours and tell you some history and some some things about what you're talking about, what you're joking about. And a lot of times people will be like, wow, I did not know that. But you know, you have to get those things out on the table in order for people to learn. You cannot conceal it all the time. You cannot hide it. You cannot they think that it's not there or those types of thinking isn't there. Get it out on the table. When we talk about being relatives in a human setting, you know, just like your family, right? I got brothers. I got a sister. We argue all the time. We will argue with each other, but we come back together and we still love each other. We have differences. We think differently. We believe different things, but we come back together again. That's the type of eh, we talk about. So uh, people like to build fences, but it wasn't like that for us as Native people. We, we didn't it's have those kind of things. We used to, you know, um, that, that, that system that we had, that we still have today, that includes communication in the form of joking, arguing, praying, singing, all of those things. And we teach each other from those things. Even in ceremony, sometimes one of our relatives might do something wrong procedurally and we correct them. We say, hey, 
that's not how you do it. This is the way you do it. This is how the story goes. And so we teach each other that way. We may sometimes feel offended by it, but we get over it. And we, we talk to each other again as relatives, you know. And so a lot of times when we talk about these, these types of things, uh, we have to look at it in the context of everybody, us humans. We're in this together, you know. We have one home here on earth. And so we have to make sure that we take care of it and we take care of each other also. We, we will, we're brothers, um, we're sisters of each other and we're relatives. And so we have to teach each other. We had to put each other in check sometimes, right? That's how we do. That's how I talk to my younger brothers. And they also do that to me too. If I, if I make a mistake, if I say something wrong, hey, that's not in line with our teachings. That's not in line with, and a lot of our teachings is the way of nature, the way, how nature moves, you know. People always ask us, why do you do things this way? Because nature moves in that way. We just, we are part of, are a part of it. And so we have to move in that fashion too. Same way with our language, you know. And then we say, and then we say, shabikaho. So it means our words move in a clockwise direction because that's the way the sun moves too. And so if we go out of line, there's corrective measures. And a lot of times that involves family. I think New England has slightly different challenges um, because uh, there are only, uh, there's only one group that's really officially recognized. And that is the group that the school teachers mention. And they fail to mention all the other people who lived here and focus on the Wampanoag people um, on the South shore of New England or uh, of Massachusetts. And uh, this is something I'd like to specifically see happen in the school curriculum here in our area. And that would be to pro properly identify all the different people who lived here and uh, the great time span in which they lived here. And that they are, and the other thing that, that bugs me is particularly that the students get is to eliminate the idea that there is some monolithic uh, uh, image of an Indian and that they were all the same. You had so many different groups of people here living here over a, a 12 or 14,000 year period uh, since the end of the last ice age and uh, uh, they they all have moved around and not been in the same place and they've all been different. They're not all the same people, all with the same thing. Um, even though we're all humans, there's still need, there needs to be some differentiation there. Um, and, and I also think that it's very important to, to uh, not um, sanitize or whitewash the history. The, the students need to know about the violence they need to know about the injustices that were done. Um, it can't all just come down to a replay of, you know, the cowboy and Indian story. Cowboys and Indians, like 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 my generation used to play when we were kids. Um, but uh, uh, you know, and and I'd like to see that change in the schools. I've seen, and the teachers are just tremendously ignorant. They don't seem to include t instruction for teachers on how to present this information. So the biggest push needs to be for teacher education so that they know what, what to say. I, I know it was important for me and my grandchildren, they, they, uh, my grandchildren's teachers would have me come in to show, you know, this is how a wigwam was made and, and here we're gonna make a dream catcher and here, you know, whatever, whatever it was, but, um, they would tell stories that one teacher told a story about how the colonists had spoiled the Indians corn and that that's why the Indians corn was all different colors. It wasn't that too bad. <laughs> she was implying that Indian corn is not, not edible or inedible. Um, and that, uh, and that the, and this was, this was how the Indians weren't treated properly by the colonists spoiling their corn. Ridiculous story. And there's so much uh, misinformation that's given in, in K-12 information, if, if there's any information given at all. So I, I think a lot of reform in teacher education is needed. Would you, would you say that, um, 
and I think you touched on your own research, sort of trying to incorporate authenticity of voice from extant indigenous groups that are here and sort of the difficulty of hearing from people directly. Um, because I know when we first reached out to the Massachusetts tribe on the acknowledgement, there was a moment of like, thank you for asking directly, you know, thank you for actually consulting us about our own history, which I thought was to me seemed uh, like an obvious statement, but um, apparently it's not as, you know, not as obvious as it might might be. So. Um, it's not done. A lot of the groups are very recent. Uh, some groups have sort of adopted identities without uh, a, a historical context or have mixed up their identities with others or have appropriated other con group concepts from other groups. So that, that at least here in New England, I'm, I'm sure this is not as much the case on the West, the West but in New England, uh, there's been such a long period of erasure that there are only a few groups that really do have a, a, a firm grip on their history that, that goes back. And the others are all reconstituting it uh, from diverse sources. There's a lot of defensiveness about identity. Uh, it's difficult to consult with indigenous groups here uh, because they often don't know themselves exactly what's what. Um, and are trying to re retraditionalize, and they're having to do that by combining elements from different groups. Um, you, you had at, in the wake of King Philip's War, all of those groups were were mixed together. You know, you would had the Pawtucket uh, would be with with their former enemies in 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 Maine or in uh, New York. Uh, I spoke to a a, a Penacook uh, family who assured me that they were always, uh, they always had matrilineal clans. They became matrilineal during the historical period because they were interned within a matrilineal group and they adopted that as a way of, uh, of surviving. They didn't realize that they weren't that originally which you know you learn from other sources that are historical. So I think that, um, I think that it's, it, it, and also the, the indigenous sources are not always accurate. Um, and uh, there, there's, a, there's often the resentment and a unwillingness to collaborate or, or coordinate activities. Uh, and I, I, I just have felt very frustrated trying to, um, you know, trying to uh, work with indigenous people here on their history because there's just they just don't want to have certain things um they want it to be a certain way and if what I, if, if there's evidence to the contrary they don't want to see that evidence kind of thing so it's it's been it's been very tricky it needs to be worked on well and then the overlay of that is you know people are concerned in a lot of groups that having these hard conversations um, and, you know, having a conversation with family means that there's a lot of feeling that it's a zero sum game, right? That if you acknowledge someone else's hardship, that it's taking something away from you or it's taking away from the history or, yeah. you know, there's an emotional side there too. There is. Um, I want to give, Anna, I don't see, I don't Anna. see anybody with their hand raised. Sure. Oh, yes, sir. Um, can I go ahead and say something real quick on that? Of course, and then if, yeah, then we'll sort of give each of you final thoughts. And if, if anyone in the audience okay. does want to say something, um, now's your chance. But after that, we'll sort of give our panelists the, the floor. So, okay. so go for it. I, I, want to, I want to talk, of course, I'm always coming from the traditional aspect. Um, uh, in my studies, in my time in, in, in academia, I mean, I've seen all sorts of research, right? I've seen all sorts of research. I've read stuff. Um, some of it is contrary to what we call traditional um, knowledge. Some of it is in a, right in alignment with it. But I'll tell you this much. From the Bilagana research method, it tends to taint the information. So when you research, you'll have two different methods. You're going to have a, um, a method that observes something and then you're going to have a method where the researcher is right in the middle of it okay so when you're uh, the researcher looking from the outside 
they call that quantitative. So when you look at something through like a microscope, you can say, okay, there's 13 cells here and you know they're dividing at this rate and you're getting 24 cells in this many minutes. So you're quantifying data. Now, when you're in the middle of it, like let's say a researcher, an anthropologist comes to the Navajo Nation and tries to live among the Navajos, that's called qualitative research. But the thing about it is you're looking at it in a sense of you're looking at, okay, the Navajos get up at 5 a.m. and they go and they shake their blankets out. They say a morning prayer. You know, they're observing in that way. So you're, you're, you're putting the researcher right in the middle of everything. And that researcher is there basically keeping a record of what's going on. The thing about qualitative research is you still have to quantify it. Five Navajos get up at 5 a.m. And, you know, that's the way Bilagana research works. You have to quantify it. Now, the thing about that is if you do a qualitative research and you quantify it, sometimes along the way, researchers will get frustrated and they'll fudge the numbers, right? Just to get their study in. And that is a real disservice to what we call researching native people. And so um, they tend to make it up along the way. And on the other side of it, the researchers will blame us. The Navajos are making it up along the way, right? So we'll get into a, a research debate. Who are you researching? Do you really wanna know some history? If you wanna know some history, you're going to have to let go of those types of methodologies. You're going to have to come up with some better way to research it. But the Vilagana, they don't want to do that. They say, this is how we research stuff. This is, you know, and you know why? Because we get grant money if we quantify stuff. We get funding for that. So it's, it, goes, it comes down to satisfying those who fund research. And that's, if you talk about social justice, that's a disservice to us. That's an injustice to us Native people. Now, if you really want to sit down and have a conversation, you come here and you have a conversation without any bounds like that. And you will get the truth. And all of that will be, it will unlock all of those missing links of research, you know, all those inconsistencies. That's all. You just have to communicate like that. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, I'll say this uh, from a personal point. Uh, I'm not going to speak on behalf of every native in the United States, but stop looking at us as victims and look at us as survivors, as warriors, because that's what we are. That is our nature. If you keep looking at us as victims, you put a label on us too, and you talk about social justice, that's an injustice to us if you put that label on us. And so stop looking at us as victims, you know, because, you know, even if you look at the East Coast natives, not every one of them was forced into a Bilagana camp. Not every one of them was violated. Some of those people actually went over there willingly. They intermingled, you know, it, it, it wasn't always by force. Now, I'll tell you this, my freshman year of college, I was writing a paper and it was a sociology class and I was reading the, the textbook. And I always looked at myself as a Navajo, as a victim of circumstance. And I, after I read the, this particular book, I'm like, wow, we did this too. Us native people, we had captives. We captured other native people and made them our slaves. We captured Mexicans and we made them our slaves and the Mexicans captured us and we were their slaves and back and forth. Again, it's a human thing. We tend to do those things. Humans will be humans and it's not always beautiful and it's not always good. But you have to take the good, the bad, and the ugly with this. Because that's the only way we will make any forward movement in understanding each other 
and truly being equitable in how we treat each other. Otherwise, we're, we're, we're singing the same song, we're riding the same ship, we're not doing anything to promote justice in any way, shape, or form. So we have to make those changes when we talk about this. We're talking about human rights and social justice and these things. You know, it's got to improve. It's got to change in how we go about doing these things. There's too many boundaries. There's too many. You put this in a box here. You're a group here. We're going to label you here. What do we call you? How do we address you? These types of things. And it, it's simple. Call everything for what it is. You're a human being, right? You're Billa Ashla'i. The earth is our mother. The father is our sky. All of these things. Simple. Don't make it too complex. Because that's what we do to appease our funders and appease our donating population, right? We have to break away from that. We have I, to understand for I what have it is. To, I just have to uh, interrupt to say that uh, I did all my research without any funding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had did, no I funding at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I did my my uh, doctoral um, final project, my thesis uh, uh, dissertation. It was actually on uh, my own tribe, and I use IHS data. But the thing was, you got a data, you got a set of data here, you got a set of data here. Um, what's 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 the barrier? And I found out that the language can be a barrier for good healthcare on native for native people because we call we don't understand uh certain terminology we don't understand certain things in in uh, bilagana medicine and so we have to make a bridge so that way we're getting good health care and we're understanding it at the same time so mm. asu if you ever get a chance check out my uh, research <laughs> i will uh, very any final thoughts before we wrap things up thank um, you dr ness well, I'd, I'd just like to congratulate you and your group for the work that you're doing. I think it's wonderful. And uh, I think that uh, raising awareness about the, uh, the survival and the resilience of indigenous people here and also apparently um, elsewhere in the country or out West and so on, uh, that, that's very, that's a very important, that's the most important thing. As the Center for Native American Awareness says, they, that is here in Danvers, uh, they have a big poster and it just says, we are here, we are here. Uh, and, you know, that's, that is the big message. Um, and that is, and we are, that's where we all are. We all are here and we're here together. And uh, we, we just need to um, treat each other right listen to each other and talk to each other and uh, do the right things. <laughs> you both make it sound so simple, but we're, uh, uh, well, so we're, it's a work in progress. Says it's simple. So yeah. I agree with him. I think it is simple. I, I don't disagree. I think that's what we're working towards. So, um, well, on behalf of the Hamilton Lenham Human Rights Coalition, I want to thank both of you for your incredible sharing of time and knowledge. Um, to those of you listening at home, the coalition is here for these kinds of hard conversations to try to imbue facts with knowledge and emotion to not put people in boxes. We're all about breaking down boxes in and among neighbors, sharing information, owning the hard truths and looking to the future. So um, that is our purpose and our goal. Um, for those of you listening, we have some great programming coming up the rest of the month. We've got Juneteenth flag raisings in both Hamilton and Wenham this week. Uh, the first ever Hamilton Wenham Pride Picnic on June 27th. Uh, we have a presentation by the North Shore Juneteenth Association on July 5th and a whole summer series of webinars. This was actually the first webinar of the 2021 summer series. So our purpose is education and knowledge. Um, and while we're sort of thinking about Native and Indigenous issues. On October 7th, we're going to have a private screening of Dawn Land with Missy, Missy Lesher. Uh, Dr. Lesser is one of the founders of the Upstander Project here in Boston, and we're going to have a film screening and conversation uh, all about that topic as well. So this is not this is not a one and done topic on Indigenous issues. This is the first of many conversations, and we're really looking forward to keeping everyone together and learning from each other. So. Right. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nez, for joining us from out <laughs> far away. And uh, thank, you. thank you, Mary Ellen Poinka, for joining us from a little bit closer to home. And uh, thank you for all of us who are, um, who are here on the panel. It was a great conversation. Wonderful. All right. Yeah, almost <laughs> so. Thank you. Bye, right. everybody. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, everyone.